It's my pleasure to introduce Richard Unger, who was here, uh, I think it was about six years ago, I think we've, um, we've agreed. Um, I don't know if you got to hear him then. Uh, I'll tell you, I have to admit, when, when, when I heard that Richard was going to speak six years ago, I was a little skeptical. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> Um, but I listened to him speak, and I tell you, I was blown away, blown away by just how much research has gone into this. 50 years of research, over 60,000 pairs of hands he's looked at. The man knows his stuff. Um, so much I had people over my house. He was, <laughs> you don't remember, but um, I actually still remember what he told me about my hands. I think about that every once in a while. So um, please uh, welcome Richard back. We're very pleased to have him. Thank you. Oh, I'm reverberating. It's good to be here. Uh, have I read anybody else's hands here? Who? Oh my. Oh yeah. So whose whose hands haven't I read? Okay. Okay. So. I have um, three main points to cover tonight. At least that's my plan. We'll see what happens. One is that uh, what I've learned, actually it's not quite uh, 50 years. I'm in my 50th year reading hands. It'll be 50 years next summer that I started reading hands. And uh, actually I started teaching hand reading in 1969. Some of you were around then, I see. A few of you anyway. But anyway, my, my three points tonight is one, you have a life purpose. I'm going to be talking about that at the beginning. Does anybody here think that there's a particular reason you're here on this planet right now? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, the hands have taught me that you have a particular reason that you're here on this planet right now. And I'm going to be talking about that. Uh, the, the second point I'm going to be talking about is that your life purpose is printed in your fingerprints. And therefore, it is objectively knowable, which is an interesting thing to consider. And the third point is that knowing your life purpose can change your life. So that's, uh, that's the outline for tonight. So, um, I've been talking to groups about life purpose for a long time. When I do a life purpose workshop, uh, I ask people to take out uh, uh, the yellow pads that are spread about and to write down, my life purpose is. And uh, there's a lot of sleeves being rolled up, a lot of uh, eyeglasses. Oh, I'm all connected with things here. Eyeglasses off and on. Uh, you know, as people write down their life purpose, my life purpose is. You can be thinking of that or writing it down yourself right now, my life purpose is. So a few minutes into life purpose workshop, I'm asking people to read off what they've written down about their life purpose. I get slightly different answers on the East Coast than the West Coast. Slightly different answer. That's how they laugh on the East Coast uh, when, I met, when I say the West Coast. The Gulf Coast has slightly different answers as well. They, they give me different answers in Texas. You can be guessing. And the Europeans have slightly different answers. But one of the things you're all thinking, that my life purpose is you've got it written down on either your imaginary yellow pad or on the yellow <laughs> pad right there. So... 
people will read off their life purpose. Well, that's, that's what I'm asking them to do in the workshop. You know, so they stand up and they go, <clears throat> my life purpose. This is a West Coast answer now. My life purpose is to grow, to evolve, to be all I can be, to swim in the cosmic sea of being <laughs> and universal light of oneness, to experience. <laughs> that wasn't your answer? That's your, that was your answer. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but only a little. Um, that's nice. Uh, my life purpose is still the West Coast here. My life purpose is to be all I can be, to grow into all I can be, to make new friends, one new friend every day, to be kind to the plants and the animals, to leave the planet better than it was before I came. Like this. By the way, are these... Yes! Are these, are these nice things that I'm saying? That's West Coast too? Yeah, so far only West Coast. Yeah, so none of these are what I mean by the term life purpose. Those are universals. We're all, I assume, attempting to be all we can be as opposed to we're attempting to be less uh, than we can be. Uh, what does that even mean? How, what are you doing on Monday about being all you can be? What, what part of all is up for you this Monday? It, too vague. That, you know, like your uh, exam in school, you hand in your what I did for a summer vacation paper, the answer comes back, you know, C plus, too vague. East Coast, you wanted to know who here besides myself is from the East Coast originally? Okay. A fair smattering. So I ask uh, an East Coast group to tell me about their life purpose, and there'll be at least one person who says, you're supposed to tell me, I'm not telling you. Uh, see, no, when I tell East Coast groups that, nobody laughs. They go, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's why we're here. No, on the East Coast, I'll get more answers like this. My life purpose is to go public with my company before I'm 35, to have enough money to retire before I'm 40, to canoe the entire Yukon River, like this. So how many of you have canoed the entire Yukon River? <laughs> you have more to do. <laughs> so to me, those aren't life purposes. Those are goals. Is it good to have goals? Is it bad to have goals? I don't know. <laughs> They're goals. That's, that's not part of this discussion today. This is about life purpose. Life purpose is something deeper than that. I get different answers on the Gulf Coast. I lived in Texas for 10 years. Am I the only one here? Oh. Good to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> I get more family and or religious answers in Texas. My life purpose is to be a good mother, be a good father, good be a br brother, son, daughter. You want to argue with anybody who says that? I don't. I'll tell you that in a second. I'm not through with the Gulf Coast yet. <laughs> Texas is a big state. I, have <laughs> I haven't covered the entirety of Texas yet. Or I get religious answers. That's where I was going next. My life purpose is to be a good Christian. You want to argue with anybody who says that? No, I don't. And as a matter of fact, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything right about that? Neither. That's fine. That's a person's religion. But if that was your life purpose, you got one billion other people on the planet with the same life purpose as you. And that's not what I mean by life purpose. I get more philosophic answers in Europe. Where I taught for half the time I was in Zurich, I've spent 29 years going to Zurich teaching hands. And the place that I taught, where I did uh, most of my teaching, was the building next to the Jung Center. Oh. <laughs> That's also where I lived while I was out there. So I would look out the window 
It's not a Jung Center, that was the Jung Center. And I did get to read for some 90 plus year old original circle Jung disciples while I was out there. That was interesting. So I mean something different about life purpose. I'm talking about some inner directive, some guiding principle of life, some aspect of consciousness. It is your job to find the access point to such that you have a tractor beam leading you towards meaning and fulfillment in your life. Life purpose is not a place to get your life into. Life purpose is something, this is what the hands have taught me. Life purpose is something that is inner generated. It's there from the get-go. It was printed in your fingerprints before you were even born. When you were this big, you already had a printout as to why it is that you came here in this lifetime. Follow the map in your fingerprints or don't, but that's a map to where your deepest meaning and fulfillment can be found. I'm going to bring a, a seat, a large seat for myself, so I can either stand up or sit down as I please. Thank you. No, that's good. I'll get it. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll be taller. Yeah. So somehow, there, I'm going to explain more about it in a second, but somehow there is a map. There's a map printed on your body five months before you were born. You're this big when that map was completely finalized. And if I had the means for looking in there and taking a picture of it, I'd be able to tell your mommy and daddy and leave a recording for you as to what it is that your agreements are for this lifetime. That's an astounding assertion. I'm going to tell you how I came to that conclusion and how knowing that information can change a person's life. But at this point, I've read, I don't know, something in the neighborhood of 60,000 pair of hands. I have taught, I don't know, 1,000 people uh, plus the system that I'm going to be teaching tomorrow. I've gotten feedback from a goodly number of them. Students have employed the same system and reported back on the results that they've received. The system that I'm going to be talking about right now and explaining in more detail tomorrow, um, I've barely changed it at all from when I started using it in 1979. So, join me, if you will, to 1979. At least a few of you were around back then. <laughs> By 1979, I had read about 12,000 pair of hands, and I was living in Houston, Texas. And there was something missing. Uh, I had read pretty much every book that's ever been printed in English, on palmistry, that's not as big an achievement as it might sound. There's only a few hundred of them. A lot of them were repeats of the same stuff. Every attempt at systemizing what was in hands, I took notes, looked at hands, tried to use the systems I was learning about. So apparently, what's left in literature is just the bare remnants of an ancient wisdom system that Aristotle was writing about 2,500 years ago. Some of what he wrote is still extant. There's not much writing going back pre-Aristotle. And he was talking about hand reading being the most ancient of arts. Too bad so much has been lost to antiquity. That's what he was saying a long time ago. If you were a man of letters in medieval Europe, I don't think there were women of letters. 
you no doubt studied palmistry because everybody else did in the universities of Europe until 1580 when it became a capital offense. And those of you who remember your European history can piece together how that came to be without my explaining it. Since then, handwriting has been kind of sort of underground, not really pursued thoroughly. So uh, I would catalog uh, the hands I was reading. I was asking people to tell me what was going on in their life. I'd have my half dozen palmistry books out, my favorites. I'd be looking at the different heart line diagrams. I'd be asking Tina about her love life and then she would just talk incessantly for hours at a time as I looked at the diagrams and tried to make sense out of it all. And I would be getting ideas about what parts of what I was reading was true and which parts weren't true. And as soon as I thought I had something nailed, the next pair of hands I looked at, the same markings, different behaviors. There were, uh, obviously there was a missing variable or none of this worked at all, but I didn't believe that none of this worked at all. I preferred the missing variable theory. So I was living in Houston and I decided to go to the uh, medical libraries because I heard that there was information on hands in the medical libraries. So I walked on down to the Jesse Jones Library in Houston, Texas. And after I fumbled around a little, I found that there were over 6,000 articles in that one library that doctors, geneticists had written about the lines in the hands, the hand shapes, fingerprints. This is palmistry by doctors, and there was more information here than in all the books I had, all the palmistry books I had read so far. They used a different language than the palmistry books did. This is the area called the moon in palmistry books. This is the hypothenar eminence in medical textbooks. So apparently, people with different diseases have different fingerprints from each other. Go figure. This has been, again, this has been studied in tremendous amount of detail. There's no argument in, in medicine that fingerprints are a diagnostic indicator. The way most of the articles were written, <clears throat> the way most of the articles were written is we're going to study type 1 diabetes. We've got 400 type 1 diabetics and 400 control group. That's usually the grad students, nurses, the people who worked in the hospital, like that. There's maybe a dozen different variables that are used in all the studies. They use the same variables. They usually pick four or five of the, of the dirty dozen variables. Same ones that they were using at the turn of the 20th century. They conclude that the people with type 1 diabetes have a lot more of this than the control group and a lot less than that. And we'd like a lot more money to study a bigger group. Almost all of the studies ended that way. Please give us more money and we could study a bigger group. And I never read a, a, a study where they said, thank you so much for all the money. That's all the people we needed. <laughs> then there'd be another study in a different country with type 1 diabetics and they would pick <clears throat> some of the same variables and some different variables, and they come to a slightly different conclusion, then they say, darn, if we had a larger sample size, we can get this down. So there should be a, a, a larger sample size. <sighs> anyway, I wasn't as interested in the research on different diseases. What I did was I looked through the list of articles and textbooks and I put a star next to the ones that had to do with behavior. Usually they had to do with aberrant behaviors. Behavior is weird enough that it would get you into a clinic to be studied and have your fingerprints compared to average people. Again, the doctors, the nurses, and the other people who worked in the clinic. And apparently, different behaviors are associated with different fingerprints. 
and different problematic behaviors are associated with different fingerprints. Statistics do not lie about this stuff. Again, it would have been nice if they looked at a few more variables, but they weren't having any trouble putting together profiles. People with this disease have a lot of this and a little of that, and people with, well, one of the factors that was studied a lot was autism. Actually, a favorite study was schizophrenia. You know, of course, that the schizophrenics have a lot of composite worlds on the moon. Yeah, there's books. Um, the last I checked, there was just under 40 different studies on schizophrenic lines and fingerprints. That's quite a bit. So here's what I learned. <clears throat> so um, er my whole life changed for me when I read Fingerprints, Palms, and Souls. That's S-O-L-E-S, -E Souls of the Feet. Fingerprints, Palms, and Souls by Dr. Cummins, written in the early 1930s. This is the standard textbook in the field. Hasn't changed since I was studying it in the winter of 79. Dr. Cummins came up with the title Dermatoglyphics. Doctors do not do palmistry, they do dermatoglyphic research. If anybody asks you, you are at a dermatoglyphic lecture and presentation. <laughs> Dermato, skin, glyphics, carvings, skin carvings, dermatoglyphics, fingerprints. So at this point, I have figured out the doctor's code. I know what the different parts of the hands are called in medical ease. I have been reading about different diseases. I've got my computer run. In those days, people didn't have their own computers, but they were, com you know, those like, you know, those lists of pages that would form this long Z-like thing, where there was page after page, and it was all, it all came off of some printer someplace. So I had my starred articles, my double starred articles, my books. I had waited several days to get fingerprints, palms, and soul from the Tulsa Medical Library. It finally arrived. So I sat down and I had stacks all around me of different medical journals of articles I've been reading when they delivered fingerprint palms and souls to my little cubicle. I've been showing up every morning when the library opened, leaving when they kicked me out. I think maybe I went to the bathroom once. I was just so engrossed in what I was doing. I was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, I've been studying this stuff for so long. I've been rereading the same books over and over again just to get one little tidbit, and all of a sudden I find a treasure trove of information. It was just in code, that's all. And apparently, not one of the doctors have read one palmistry book, and not one of the palmists have read one medical book. Two groups, like Republicans and Democrats, refusing to speak to each other, studying the exact same stuff. One group speaks in charts and numbers. The other group speaks in anecdotal stories and mythical creatures. This is the Jupiter finger in palmistry books. It's the A finger in the medical, the A finger the B finger, the C finger, very creative. But they wouldn't <laughs> want to use, neither side would want to use language that the other side uses. They wouldn't want to be caught dead with anybody from the other group. I'm not one of them. <sighs> Crazy. In any event, so I'm reading Cummins, actually Cummins and Midlow, his partner was Midlow, M-I-D-L-O. Cummins and Midlow, Cummins got famous, by the way, because of his research into retardation, as it was called in the 1930s. He found that people who had a single line across the hand, the simian crease like I do, had 20% higher rates of different types of retardation. This was scoffed at, he was ridiculed, and he was found to be correct 
20 years later, he was proven right. Have you ever been found right 20 years after the fact? Did the people have to come up and beg for your forgiveness for calling you wrong all those years? <laughs> Wasn't that the best day that you can remember? Remember when you told me not to marry that person? <laughs> you were right. So anyway, I'm reading through Cummins and Midlow. <clears throat> and what I learned completely changed my life. And as I'm sitting here right now, I'm feeling the same surge of current go through me as went through me that afternoon in the medical stacks. Well, so here's what uh, Dr. Cummins had to say on page 83. As the little fetus is developing, this is 1930, as the little fetus is developing, it has a little, what is going to be a hand. And what is going to be a hand has 11 different components. It looks like 11 ping pong balls squeezed kind of tight together. You've all seen photos of developing fetuses. First week, eighth week, 16th week, you might not have paid too much attention to the hands. They didn't have those photos then. But, of course, we've all seen those photos now, or at least most of us have. So 11 ball-like structures form. One is going to become your thumb, one's going to become your A finger, etc., and then six more are going to become the parts of the palm. 11 volar pads, they're called, form. And then they recede, they kind of shrink, and then you know, the hand starts to look more like what you're familiar with. While they're doing their shrinking, the skin corrugations appear. Just at the beginning of the shrinking phase, the skin corrugations, the fingerprints, appear. That's the 16th week after conception. Within two weeks, they're finalized, your fingerprints. And here's the part that sent the shock of current through me. The lines that make up your fingerprint form a topographic map of the developing fetal hand. You've seen a topographic map. You've gone hiking someplace. You've got circles where there are mountains. You've got like uh, parallel lines wide apart where there's plains. Well, Cummins was saying that you can see the size and shape of each of the 11 pads that eventually became your hand and fingers and thumb. You can see the size and shape of each 11 of them in comparison to each other by looking at that frozen map, because everybody knows you can't change your fingerprints. That map once formed is frozen in time, no matter what your hand eventually grows into. That map, your fingerprint map, that's frozen from the 18th week after conception. Comparative size and shape, I already knew that comparative size and shape was half of how I read hands. If you have something big in your hand, this is very deep now, you need your palmistry cap. Big in palmistry, big means a lot. Anything that's big, you have lots of it. So let me see your hands here. Give them a good shake first. This has nothing to do with handwriting, I just like to watch people do this. <laughs> so put them out like this and take a look at the hands available here. Yep, four fingers and a thumb. That's the usual arrangement. <laughs> you have a pretty big thumb, young lady. <laughs> and you're a Pat. Okay. Pat's little finger is bigger than your little finger. Take a look. You see where Pat's little finger goes? Way above the line separating the upper third of the ring finger. She has about this much extra little finger. That's got to mean something. You do too. The two of you probably came from the same family. Take a look around, they're all different. Everybody's a little bit warped. You're warped this way. You're warped that way. Do you see your middle finger has this little warp? It's not just you two that are warped. Everybody's warped. <laughs> Tina's warped. So, people with big thumbs, you have a big thumb also. What's your name again? Oh, Bill. Ah, I'm falling apart here.
Big means a lot. Did I do a talk with FMBR about 25 years ago? Were you my host then? 30 years ago? You, didn't, you look the same. <laughs> Maybe a little different. In any event, big means a lot. That's where I was, wasn't I? Big means a lot. Any part of your hand that is big compared to what average is means you have a lot of that stuff. You're big in the little finger department. Big little fingered people are inquisitive, extremely inquisitive. Why are they inquisitive? Because they're very inquisitive, that's why. They're quick, sharp, and clever. Sherlock Holmes would have had a long pinky finger. I have a long pinky finger. Of course you do. You're a Sherlockian. You and I belong to the Sherlockian club because you're a big Mercurian. That's the palmistry name for the little finger. You're a Mercurian and you're pushy. You've got that thumb. You're going to push through whatever is stopping you. You're not going to let obstacles get in your way because you're self-reliant. You're going to take care of things as well. You should. Somebody has to take care of things around here. <laughs> so in hand reading, Parts that each part of the hand represents something else. This part deals with, I don't know if you could figure it out. This part here, the A finger, deals with power and authority. You never would have figured that out on your own. And the thumb tells me how a person gets things under her thumb in that self-reliant way or some other way. And all the other parts of the hand, that's the alphabet of palmistry. Each part of the hand is representative of some element of self. And there's a good reason that it is, which I'm not going into tonight. But what I was learning was that there is a map that is unaltered from prior to birth that tells me how much thumb and which type went into the original stew pot, how much mercury and which type of mercury comes in different flavors, you know, what type of mercury went into the original stew pot. It's like looking at the side of the Wheaties box and seeing the original list of ingredients most uh, you, you know, the, the one that uses up the most of the cereal is the first listed and then down the line. So I was being told that I had an unaltered map from prior to birth. You might not know this, but hands keep changing. Bill, you might have changed a little in the 30 years since I met you. And your hand has changed, but you know your fingerprints, of course, have not changed. Because we've all watched TV, you know you cannot change your fingerprints. So there's a map that can't be changed and another map that's keep cha that keeps changing. That bend, I'm sorry, what's your name in the back row? The one whose middle finger has that little bend to it? Yeah. What's your name? Victoria. Victoria. Your middle finger didn't have that bend when you were two years old. That came later. And as a matter of fact, it could have bent differently. 10 years ago, and now it's bent the way it is. It's just a little tiny bend. It's no big deal. My middle finger has a bend. You can see it from across the room, can't you? See that little bend to my middle finger? It used to be twice the bend that it is now. Hands keep changing. Has your body changed any? Does your face look exactly the way it did 30 years ago? Your, your, th your photo from 30 years ago is still recognizably you, probably. But it's changed. Your hand has changed as well, but not your fingerprints. Do you see the potential value to this? I have a pre-birth unaltered map, and then the adjusting to everything that goes on in your life map. They look, you know, there's, uh, they're related to each other, but they're not the same. Are you any different than you were a few years ago? One hopes. Look at the, look at the you that you were back then. There was more. So I'm excited. I've got a map. I know how to read hand maps already. I'm 10 years into hand reading. I have a decent idea of what thumbs like yours mean and what little fingers like yours mean. And I know what that curl on the middle finger means by then. I'm up to about 12,000 pair of hands at that point in my hand reading career. 
but there was still something missing, and, and there I was learning about it that day in the Jesse Jones Library. So, continuing with Dr. Cummins. Each fingerprint is composed of between 50 and 100 lines. That sounded right to me. Each line of each fingerprint has its own signature. Think about that. If they were comparing your fingerprints to the murder weapon, one thing they look at is what type of pattern. Is it a circle pattern? Is it a flat pattern? But that's not enough. What they do is they look at little tiny details in the lines that make up your fingerprints. This is called pattern minutia. They find six matching pieces of pattern minutia and you're cooked if it matches what's on the murder weapon. It, was, it would be a 10 billion to one shot to have six matching pattern minutia. So it's, I'm not drawing on a blackboard, so you'll have to imagine it. This is the FMB Imagine Society, right? So imagine with me. So you have a, a blow up of a fingerprint, which is circle, circle, circle. And on one of the, the third line from the middle, a piece of circle blown up, you'll see little forks in the line, little bubbles in the line, stops and starts. Seven easily classifiable criteria that can be compared to the murder weapon. Yeah, you'd need a magnifying glass for that, but take my word for it. Or don't, or, you know, here, use my magnifier and check that out. As Cummins was quick to point out, the same seven little doodads that show up on fingerprint lines show up elsewhere in nature. At the beach, when the water recedes and there's a ripple pattern in the sand at the beach, and you could put your toes to those ripples in the sand, the ripples at the shoreline stop and start, fork, bubble, split. They do the same seven things that fingerprint lines do. That's an interesting coincidence, said Dr. Cummins. Sand dunes. Sand dunes aren't smooth. They have a ridge surface, do they not? Yes, they do. And interestingly, the ridges, it's not just flat lines drawn with a ruler. Take a look next time at the sand dunes. And you'll see that the lines crossing the sand dune, stop and start, fork, split, bubble, they do the exact same seven things that the pattern at the beach and on your fingerprints. There was a photo at the bottom of the page. There was a chemical suspension. You know what a chemical suspension is? There's a beaker and some stuff is poured into the beaker and the stuff is settling down to the bottom of the beaker and an electrical current goes through and the stuff settles to the bottom of the beaker in a series of parallel lines exhibiting the same characteristics as sand dune ridging, fingerprint lines, etc. See if you're putting together what I was putting together. This is something different from what Cummins told me, but I saw it on TV, so I know it must be right. <laughs> Somebody was playing electric violin, and the violin had a wire and was co connected to a metallic plate and there were metal filings put on top of the metallic plate. Then they played a C and they showed you what kind of pattern appeared with the metal filings. And they put it down over here and then they played an A and it made a different pattern. And then they did a C and they showed it was the same pattern from the prior C. That makes sense, doesn't it? So, a wave energy imprint is capable of leaving its signature behind in a denser medium. The sand dunes is the denser medium being imprinted by the wave energy of the air currents. We can tell the different electrical current by what happened to the filings. On our bodies, five months before we're born, a wave energy imprints something or other, left behind a topographic map. A high frequency wave energy topographic map was left behind and it's readable. 
I like to think of that high frequency wave energy as a soul imprinting. Cummins thought it was more a DNA imprinting, although he didn't know the word DNA yet. It was 1930. He thought it had something to do with genetics, but for the life of him, he didn't know what it was. He wanted more research money. <laughs> and rightly so. Of course, you know what the Navajo Indians say about fingerprints. I learned that years later. The Navajos say that the great spirit breathes in the breath of life, and the tracks of that breath become your fingerprints. I like that. It's poetic. So when I look at somebody's fingerprints, I'm looking at their great spirit's breath tracks, or the genetic legacy somehow of their ancestors, or what I consider, I'm looking at your soul psychology, not your personality psychology. That is shown by that twist to your Saturn finger, the length of your Mercury finger, the thickness, the straightness of your thumb. That's your personality type. But you have a soul typing as well, with as much detail, but it's been hard to study. Where do you study that stuff? Well, you study it with hands, that's where you study it. It could be studied elsewhere. But the hands have it printed out in very specific and readable detail. That's a part of us, that's a part of you, that was there before you were even born. It stays with you your whole life, and it's unalterable. Lucky for you and me, you cannot change the message that's in your fingerprints. Your life purpose is printed in your fingerprints, where your deepest soul satisfaction could potentially be found. There's a printout in your fingerprints as to what that is. Whether you move in that direction or not, your fingerprints don't say anything about that. They've frozen in time before you were born. Win the lottery, lose the lottery, have 10 marriages, have no marriages, something in between. Your fingerprints stay exactly the same. They don't know what's going on. A part of you is that part. It lives outside of time. Its goals are not temporal. It's something else. I consider that element to be your soul psychology. It underlies, it's a map that underlies the map of your personality psychology and the map of your relationships, the events of your life, your age, et cetera, et cetera. There's three maps, but the map that holds the other maps in place is the soul psychology map, which may or may not be anything even close to what you would want it to be or hope it would be or what you imagine it would be. <laughs> it's a map as to where your deepest soul satisfaction can be found. And it's often quite surprising to the owner to find out what their fingerprints say. For instance, as you're digesting that, I hope, for instance, let's say you're in one of the leadership-oriented life purpose. I picked that one because it is really common for those who have leadership as their life purpose to be 180 degree opposed to all leaders. They hate leaders, they're all evil, they're all bad, they do the wrong things. I don't know where people get the idea that leaders could be bad. <laughs> Go figure where people come to conclusions like that. But more than half the people that have leadership oriented life purposes do everything they can to avoid any leadership position. Of course, there's something missing in their life that they can't put their finger on. <laughs> Not only that, but if I followed them around sitting on their shoulder with a little bell and rang them, I'm not going to do that because I'm, I'm busy, but if I followed them around and rang that little bell every time a leadership opportunity presented itself to him or her, they might say, there is no leadership or opportunities around here. But, you know, I'd be tired of ringing that bell. It's everywhere. Your life purpose is everywhere. Your guardian angel wants nothing better than to open the door into your life purpose for you because that's where your deepest soul satisfaction can be found. One of my uh, Texas students had a saying. She's a therapist. She said, name it and claim it. I like that. I like succinct 
sayings like that. She said, once you named somebody's life purpose, it's hard for them to not notice it. And when noticed, it's hard over time to not embrace it. It's everywhere. Your life purpose is everywhere available to you. Your life purpose is not circumstantial. You can't say, I'll do my life purpose after I finish the breakfast nook. <laughs> I mean, you could say that, but it's useless to say that. I can't do my leadership purpose now, says person A, because I'm still in school. I'm, I'm too old. I'm too young. I remember one person who told me she was 24 already. It's too late to find out her life purpose. Her whole, <laughs> her whole life has already been mapped out. Those of you older than 24 are no doubt the ones who are laughing about that. What's the life purpose of the people who choose to be leaders then? Oh, so would you like to know JFK's fingerprints? Would you like to know Martin Luther King's fingerprints? Would you like to know LBJ's fingerprints, Richard Nixon's fingerprints, Eisenhower's fingerprints? Yes, I have all those fingerprints. Freedom of Information Act. Isn't that great? <laughs> well, no. Live presidents, I don't get their fingerprints. They have to be dead, and they have to be dead for a while before they'll release their fingerprints. <laughs> if you can get Trump's fingerprints, I would appreciate that. <laughs> I, I've certainly taken a look at his hand, but his fingerprints are not really visible on TV or in a newspaper shot. So, of those presidents that I just mentioned, all except one had a leadership-oriented life purpose. Do you remember which ones I mentioned? Can you guess which one did not have a leadership life purpose? Which one would you guess? No. No. No, LBJ had an extreme... He had, he had leader wrestling with guilt issues in his fingerprints. Leader with guilt. Think about... If you have a picture in your mind of LBJ, look at his face. Remember when he's being sworn in? Take a look at that face. You could, without being a Chinese face reader, he's already got guilt printed all over his face. Leader with guilt. And then, of course, there was the war to contend with. No, it was Kennedy who had a different type of life purpose, very similar to my own. His life purpose was an inspirational communications life purpose. Inspire the masses. You're my masses tonight. That's a different type of life purpose with a different training program involved, different stumbling blocks involved. Each of the different life purposes, have, after I've read for enough of them, and after I've gotten reports from other people using the same system, there's a standard set of obstacle points that each life purpose carries with it. People handle those obstacles one way or another from a large, you know, from a, an eagle from a distance view, um, uh, if you graphed out all those lives from a far enough distance, they looked very much alike. They either stumbled on this particular life stumbling block, and if they did, a particular type of circumstance arises. There's a few stumbling blocks that are more or less the same for each of the life purposes, and then when you bump into them, well, duh, you're on this life path. No wonder you ran into that stumbling block. So if only there was a convention of a thousand people with this life purpose, a thousand people with that life purpose, a thousand here, and then they all started to compare their life stories. Some are 10 years old, some are 99 years old, and they start to compare stories, and somebody's in kindergarten, and somebody again is 99. They're finding out that their stories are very similar. The details are different. I mean, there's boys and girls, tall people, short people, but they run into the same issues over and over again. The people in the leadership-oriented life purposes run into power issues. They run into power play issues. They handle it this way, they handle it that way, they handle it th this way. So that power play bullshit at your office, that could be part of your training program. The people who are out of going out of their way to try to intimidate you, get in your way, and doing who knows what passive-aggressive maneuvers on you. Well, yeah. If you're in one of the leadership-oriented life purposes, you, know, you need to know how to handle that stuff, or the next phase of your life purpose will not emerge out of the ethers for you. You'll be stuck at this level. 
Again, after reading for enough people, the, the stories, they're not exactly the same, and it's not like I'm yawning while I read for another person. It's another fascinating individual with their own special scenarios, but there's something going on. Think about this for a second. Destiny and free will. Nature and nurture. You've got a part of you that was there before you were born and it's unalterable. You've got another part that keeps changing. You've got something printed in your hands which in your soul's wisdom is unalterable. You can't change it. Your deepest fulfillment is in this arena over here. Don't go there. That's fine. Something big will be missing. Keep bumping up against the same obstacle in new disguises. New people show up in your life. Have you ever moved to a different state? I did. Did you ever change mates, change jobs, change state, and within two years you're in the same stuff you were in back there? How did that stuff know how to find you? Oh, it's just me. Okay. Maybe. In any event, I look at a person's fingerprints. I look at their hand. About one-third of the people have fingerprints that are the exact opposite of their personality type. <laughs> A full one-third. The people who have high profile, be in the public eye life purpose, a third of them are Mr. or Ms. Shy. Isn't that interesting? Spock, you're old enough to know who Spock is. Spock could very easily have an open your heart life purpose. How ironic would that be? Soul psychology is ironic. It's, it's rife with paradox. There is no pair of hands without paradoxical parts. This is one of the things that made it more difficult for me at the beginning. I looked at a pair of hands and every pair of hands is riddled with contradictory information. At the beginning, I thought that was something wrong with me as a hand reader or the books I was reading. No, that's what people are like. You're a mass of contradictions. And as it turns out, those contradictory elements are necessary for you to become the person that if you could read the fingerprints, there was already a map there of the person you intended to be in this life if you only had eyes to see it and ears to hear it. A feedback process. I'll, I'll answer the way I'm interpreting that, and then you can tell me if I'm off on a different track than the way you intended your question. So I can tell you for me, I'll get to your question in just a second. I love Q&A, and I guess we're in Q&A. That's a good place to be. <laughs> so I can tell you for me, when I started to look at hands, which was July of 69, I picked up a palmistry book for $1.50 in Boulder, Colorado on a trip across the country in 1969. And within an hour, I was hooked on hands. And I didn't know why yet. And I was meeting all sorts of people. I was on a cross-country trip, traveling here and there. And I had my little palmistry book and I would talk to people. And as I look back now, what I can see is that the conversations I was having with people were completely different than normal conversations. It got down to what people wanted in life, what was happening. It got, it got realer fast in a way that I really liked. And I liked that realerness. And the more often I read hands, the more often I was in that environment. And the more often I was in that environment, which it turns out was right on purpose for me, the more I was in that environment, the more a certain me emerged. And I liked that me, and I liked the way that me decorated his living room. I liked the way that me did things. I liked the way my life was looking the more that me emerged out of whatever hiding place that me was there. But looking backwards, he was there all along. I just didn't know he was there. And it iterated and iterated over time. So that's a, a form of feedback. Are you asking about, do I talk to people about their life and what happened in their life? Which type of feedback were you asking? Oh, my word. Does anybody here think that you've had synchronistic events in your life? <laughs> By the way, if I asked a completely different group of people with a completely different orientation, the opposite of yours, whatever opposite means, how many of them have had synchronicities be central in their life experience, they're going to raise their hands also. 
It's universal. And have you ever had any jaw-dropping, mind-bending synchronicities? Absolutely incredible. I remember, here's one that's popping into my mind. I'm at the gas pump, and I'm putting in gas, and there across from me is an ex-girlfriend from Texas, and I'm in Sausalito putting gas in my car, and that's a woman I haven't, talked, I haven't talked to in 20 years. So I walk over to her, and I say, Anne, and it wasn't Anne. I, sw <laughs> I swore that was Anne, but it wasn't her. But the next day I got a call from Anne out of the blue. <laughs> You've all got experiences like this up the yin-yang, don't you? Every one of you have things like this that you can report. And, you know, the rational mind just goes, well, there's a million things like that and blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, you have a personality type, and in that world, it's just some accidental thing. But you've got a part of you that is your soul self. And that soul self has its own personality and its own goals. It's not so interested in this month's rent. It has larger fish to fry. You might not even like its fish. <laughs> but you're stuck with its fish and it's stuck with you because it can't live its life purpose without you and your temporal body and all your personality quirks. There was a question in the back. I didn't get to you yet. Yes. That's right. Okay, did everybody hear the question? Is it messy to go against the map that's in your fingerprints? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that. I'm, I like the question, by the way. Thank you very much. But I have a more complicated answer than you might imagine. Everything is stressy around here. I don't know if you've noticed. It's stressy here on the earth plane. <laughs> it's not easy to be a people. It's tricky business. Let's say you're exactly on purpose. Let's say you're doing everything on, as on purpose as a person can be. Let's say you're Pablo Picasso and your life purpose was the artist, let's just say. By the way, has anybody seen Picasso's works when he was a 12-year-old? Have you seen his little notebook drawings as a 12-year-old? Holy cow. <laughs> has anybody then been to a Picasso museum? Were there any pieces of art that you thought he was just mailing it in? I saw stuff that I thought he was just mailing in. I think he was just trying to impress the girl down the hall with that piece over there. He wouldn't be living his artistry in that nanosecond. He might look like an artist. He has a smock. He has an easel. But life purpose is an inside-out thing. It's a way of being. It's a consciousness to inhabit. When he inhabits his artist consciousness, He's on purpose. Is anybody here an artist of any kind? Is every minute delight? Is anybody here a writer? Do you ever face a blank page and nothing is coming out and you're straining and blah, blah, blah? Isn't that part of the path of the writer? Is that ever stressful? Did you ever write all this and then you throw it and toss it away? It could be stressful either way, but there's a different type of stress. So I have a way of responding to that that I'm getting to right now. Again, thank you for that question. So let's say, let's say you're Jacques Cousteau. You're old enough to know who Jacques Cousteau is, aren't you? Some of my students are too young to know who Jacques Cousteau is, but you're probably not in that group. And I'm a scuba diver, so that's even more reason to know who Jacques Cousteau is. So let's say you're Jacques Cousteau and you find boats, does everything get easy now? You know his son died in a boating accident. You know that. How good a day was that for Jacques? Do you think he never had problems with the, the guy in charge of this piece of equipment over here? Do you think he never had trouble with the uh, French government? Have you ever dealt with the French government? Is there any way to deal with the French government that's not trouble? 
But what I'm saying is, these are the types of trouble that if you're a Jacques Cousteau, these are the types of trouble that fit your life. You're having the right trouble, Jacques. Now let's say he's talking to the foreman at the pencil factory and complaining that things aren't fair around here. There is no good solution for Jacques at the pencil factory. He needs to find the boat. He needs the right problems to have. Imagine that he leaves boats because Mrs. Cousteau bugged him enough and said, I hate all this silly boat stuff. If you love me and the children, you'll leave those boats behind. And let's say he does. How are things going to go for Jacques? He's got the wrong problems. So very often I read for people who tell me what their problems are. And sometimes, well, no wonder you have these problems. You're on this life path. Those are the problems that a person on this life path runs into. You know, nothing you could have done would make those problems not arrive. How you manage your conversation with yourself, how you handle your self-talk around the appearance of those issues, that's something you have some, not perfect, but some control over. But when you're on a particular life path, you're not avoiding that particular obstacle. It could take a different form. A different person can be the actor or actress initiating event number 23. But you're going to bump into stuff like that. That's the right stuff for you to run into. If you're in a leadership lifetime, you're going to get humbled in this lifetime. Whether you accept that you're humbled and learn from it and grow and are in touch with yourself during that humbling, every real leader needs to go through that. Every person in the inspirational life paths needs to be grotesquely disillusioned <laughs> along the way. And the other life paths have their particular obstacle points to contend with. And when you run into one of those obstacle points, do you ever give yourself a hard time? Not you, but the person next to you. You know somebody who gives themselves a hard time and won't, give them, and won't cut themselves any slack. How are you doing with your inner critic, young lady? Thank you. It could be very releasing to know that there wasn't a different type of choice that would have made this issue not appear. So I was reading for somebody, I'm flashing on this lady, this goes back a few years. She had just come back from Kosovo and she was a, um, a therapist who worked with children in difficult circumstances. And 15 years ago in Kosovo, there were a lot of children in difficult circumstances. And she had a trauma-reducing therapy. And I was having lunch with her and another guy who also had a trauma-reducing therapy of a different type who worked in a different environment. So when I read her hands, she told me a little about her story. She said she couldn't leave Kosovo because any day she left, she would have had to like close the airplane door and there would have been a line of mommies with their babies or babies with no mommy. And if she left, that's what she'd be leaving behind. It was hard for her to leave. That was her life's work. And look at the opportunity to put it into action. But she was a mother. She had three kids. She had twin teenage girls that was at home with daddy who was doing a good job, but they needed their mommy and she'd been away for all these weeks on end. So she was wondering which way she should go. And from her fingerprints and hands, there was no way that that issue was going away in her life. She was in a dualistic life purpose that included family and included her work in the world. There was no way that she could spend enough time here and not feel bad about there or enough time here without feeling bad about there. She sat with that one for about 60 seconds before she said anything. That puts a different spin on it. I thought I wasn't handling it right. I was in all this stress because when I'm here, I'm not there. When I'm there, I'm not here. What can I do? Nothing. See if you can change your self-talk about it. If you were doing worse, you wouldn't have a family that you cared about and you wouldn't have a work that was effective. This is what you get because you're doing so well. When you get to be a better tennis player, you play against the state champ. They can return your booming serve. 
The other guys, you didn't even have to be good at other stuff because your server was good enough to carry you. But you start moving up in class, the flaws in your game get exposed. As well it should be. Things are going well. Ah, This is what well looks like, I'm telling people sometimes. I thought well would look different. Anybody else want to ask me any questions? There, there are no questions. Oh, okay. So do identical twins have identical fingerprints? So do, can you hear back there? Do identical twins have the same fingerprints? Strange you should ask that. I'm trying to remember how many pages Dr. Cummins devoted to twin studies because by the turn of the 20th century, there was a huge number of twin studies. And you saw that movie with the three triplets. How many saw the movie with the, the three boys who were triplets and didn't know each other? What's the name of that one? Three, three Identical Strangers. So my wife and I were watching that movie and I'm going, yeah, the, the twin studies, in a uh, twin studies, especially in the early 20th century, tons of twin studies. And um, uh, the finger, no, they don't have the same fingerprints. But um, you probably didn't know this until somewhere in the 1970s, if they were trying to determine, doctors, if they were trying to determine whether twins came from the same egg or not, which is obvious sometimes but not so obvious other times, and is important if there's going to be a transplant of some kind, the test that was used most was the fingerprint test. Because the, there was, uh, to oversimplify, there was a coefficient of similarity. Twins have a 0.6 coefficient of similarity, siblings 0.3, and people at random 0.1. So they look at 10 different things, they give it numbers, they put it on a big chart, and they come up with the coefficient of similarity. And that's how they did the twin test until DNA came along, which was 100% accurate instead of 95% accurate. All the more reason that more research money is needed for dermatoglyphic testing. <laughs> uh, there's not a set number, uh, but let me, let me put it this way. There's a couple of dozen, uh, 30 or so, that are the, um, the usual suspects. Uh, there's uh, life purposes that are activity specific. Uh, inspire the masses, be the artist, be the leader. There's a bunch of those. There's also a bunch of interdevelopmental inter life purposes. Develop integrity. That's an interesting one. So um, uh, each of these have various subsets that make it a little different from their neighbor. And then again, a person who grew up in a first world country and a third world country will have different integrity challenges. New Guinea tribes person versus somebody in Palo Alto will face different integrity questions during their life, but it's the same integrity question. So by the way, so let's say it's your life purpose to work on your integrity factor this lifetime. You get to the gates of heaven, whatever that means for you. You walk through this like metal detector looking thing like at the airport. <laughs> You remember what that, you remember. You walk through and it's a, in your case, it will be an integrity meter. Bup, 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 bup. If it goes past here, the gate opens, they throw the rose petals, the music, you know. <laughs> if it only goes over to here, shoots and ladders, <laughs> start again. So, do people who are working on their integrity this lifetime are those people always honest, straightforward, and do what they say they're going to do because integrity is the number one thing? No, they're like you and me. No, it's too much to live up to. And what does it even mean? You gave your word to your boss that you would take care of the Jones account, but you gave your word to your Aunt Matilda that you would be there if she called. And all of a sudden, Aunt Matilda's in a crisis and family comes first, you always said. It's on the bumper sticker on the back of your car. But you gave your word about the It's not so easy. The bumper sticker says, my word is my oath. But yeah, that's nice. But what are you going to do about this incident on Tuesday? No, the masters of integrity have been more rigorous in exploring their disintegrities. They've been more defenseless in their listening to their inner voice about how they didn't measure up. They have recommitted 
and held themselves to account in a way that they didn't used to be as masterly back when they were earlier in the process. So, the ways in which disintegrity have ruined everything comes home to roost quicker and more extremely for those who are studying that course at the Earth University. We're all auditing. All the courses available, we're all taking some of them. There isn't anybody who's not at least auditing Integrity 101, doing better, not doing better, whatever, but we're all auditing. But for people who have that in their fingerprints, every major incident in their life is only about that one issue. You can make a case that what happened that Tuesday wasn't about this issue, but you start looking at a larger mosaic of the events in their life, and you compare that to the other people with the same life path, it's the same story for all of them. That could be a big shell game. I could have invented that in my imagination. I could have thought that all up. But then that means that the other people that I've taught the system to who report the same findings are also making it up. Andre loved reading fingerprints. We have a friend in common. Uh, this is a little bit far afield. Maybe. Oh, I like those questions, the far afield questions. Okay, so are you familiar with the cosmic microwave background radiation? Of course. So the, the, like the W map and such. Uh, to me, that's kind of a fingerprint of the universe. At the you, read my, you read my article on that. Yeah, it's exactly, the, it's, a, it's a universal fingerprint, and it was formed the same way. From, from uh, the, the quantum activity. Absolutely. The, the, the universe rang like a bell 300,000 years after the Big Bang, leaving behind a signature. It's in the same format as fingerprint signatures. So, so does that mean the universe has a purpose? And it's purpose? That's my interpretation, but I, can't, I don't know how to read it the same way I know how to read the stuff on the hands. <laughs> But it's the same type of map. Yes, yeah, the W map satellite. Yeah, I was following that from the get-go. Oh, yeah. The Fingerprints of God was my article on that one. <laughs> that's, that's outside the scope of my studies. It sure is. Yeah. There's patterns in nature, aren't there? Yeah, yeah there are patterns in nature. So one of the, uh, no more questions? Oh, yeah. Can everybody hear? Do you mind standing up? No, I, w I wouldn't be able to see anything like that. Yeah, uh, her, her twin sister had a similar accident more or less at the same time that she did. And by the way, uh, does this shock you to hear a story like that? Do you go, that can't possibly be? No, that, that sounds human nature-y enough. Uh, but I wouldn't be able to tell that. Nor would I be able to know, this brings up a, a good point, I think, nor would I be able to tell how well you're doing with your life purpose by looking at your hand today. Think about that. So we're back to Picasso. I was talking to somebody over here about Picasso. He was still painting in his young 90s, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So, it's Monday morning. Is Picasso on purpose this morning as, he looking, as he's looking at his blank canvas? I can't tell from the outside, can you? Picasso might not be able to tell. Maybe he's dozing. Maybe he's thinking about the girl down the hall. He did a lot of that. <laughs> Maybe he has artist block and you know he's trying to paint but it's not coming out of him yet. I don't know. You can't tell from the outside. So every pair of hands, I take a look at the hands, and I can guess, I mean, it's one of the things I do, I surmise, I assume, I guess, 
I'm looking around and going, wow, this person would have a lot to overcome if they were going to be living their artistry, let's say. But I have no idea whether they are or not. People overcome all sorts of things. You know, people tell me all sorts of stories of what they did, and I go, wow, you had to face this, you had to face that, you had to face this, and you did? Holy cow. And you're only 40, and you already faced these three dragons on your life path? That's absolutely incredible. But I wouldn't know by looking at the hand. Again, I can guess, but I don't know. Think about that for a second. I've thought about it for more than a second. What that tells me is that each one of us is on a pencil point. We're on a pencil point balanced between completely immersed in our life purpose consciousness, clear, clean, and on purpose, or off in some other realm, avoiding, pushing back, hiding, whatever. We're each, in each nanosecond, making choices that tilt the story this way or that way. Tilt the story again, each nanosecond, again and again. And your life has been like that all along. I find that interesting. So I'm back to the, I'll get to your question, and I'm going to get to somebody else and then come back to you. But I like the um, free will and destiny dilemma. I love the free will destiny. Uh, some people say that destiny is just a literary device. Rationalists say that. It's just something that people make up. They're wrong at least from what the hands have taught me, there is a destiny. You have in your hands an exalted destiny possibility printed on it, but you also have free will. Go through this door, not that door. If I hadn't picked up that book in Boulder, Colorado, would I be here today talking to you? I've had that discussion many times. Alana says you would be having the same discussion at the same place had you not picked up that book in Boulder, Colorado. The skids were greased for you, Richard, she says. That's my wife. There was no way you weren't going in this direction. Maybe. You had a question? Yeah. On the lines of the hands, I'll call it the fingerprint. On the lines of the hands, the lines here, on this one, on the fingerprint? No. So the question is, are these lines part of the fingerprints? No, those are lines. Because the two hands are different. Yes, the two hands are different. But... Well, no, and they're both different from the fingerprints, and the lines in your hands are changeable. Those lines change. They tell me about different personality attributes in very great detail. But what you might not know is that your whole palmar surface is covered with fingerprints, not just the fingertips. So when, they, when the FBI takes palm prints, you know, as the guy was leaving the crime scene, they left a palm print in blood. They now have a, uh, a database of palm prints as well, the FBI does. And you have fingerprints all over your palm. Usually in a reading, I only glance at them. I'm looking for something weird I'm not expecting. If I don't find it, there's so many other things to talk about in a reading. But you have fingerprints on your palm as well. The lines keep changing. And the, looking at a person's line formations gives me very specific detail. Just as a, for instance, one of those lines, yours tends to go this way. One of those lines is your heart line. What's your name? Mahmoud. Mahmoud. Mahmoud's heart line does this. Your heart line might do that. That's the upper transverse crease about an inch or so away from your fingers. The heart line does not tell me how you're doing in relationship, how many marriages you have had, will have, how many children you have had, will, it doesn't tell me any of those things. The hand doesn't carry that type of information, at least in no way that I've been able to decode so far. But it does tell me what emotional type you are. There are different emotional types on the planet. Type A says, I love you. Type L says, I love you. They don't mean anything close to the same thing. They use the same words. One person says, let's grow old together. The other person says, I'm hot right now. They use the same language, but they might not be saying the same thing to each other. There's a lot of miscommunication that takes place between different heart line types. We haven't separated out for different languages. So just because you have a particular heart line type doesn't mean that you can't be happy in love or you are automatically happy in love, but you have a way that suits you better 
And one of the rules in handwriting is be your type. It's your job to be an advanced version of the Mahmoud type. By the way, has anybody here had a Myers-Briggs test? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, you all know what I'm talking about. So you answer 100 questions, and then they tell you that you're an ABC type or an elemental P type. And they're, they're, you know, it's kind of interesting the way they do it, and they sell 3 million of them a year. The typing from the Myers-Briggs exam is your hand shape type. It corresponds to your hand shape. But it doesn't say, if any of you have had a Myers-Briggs, is there anything in there about what your soul's yearning for? Does it tell you what your life purpose or your karmic wounds are? This is not its fault either. It's not part of its program. The Geiger counter doesn't tell you what color your shirt is either. It's just not what it does. The fingerprints have that information. <laughs> Zero? Pardon me? Zero? I didn't see any. And so I went to where he lived afterwards, and there was like no furniture in the house. No lines, no furniture. And he lived with his parents. And I said, what do you do for a living? Never worked. And he, he, he said, people tell me maybe I've never lived. <laughs> So this is, this is, you know, people tell me weird stories. Yeah. Apparently, being a hand reader gives people the right to tell me weird stories. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> That's a new one. There is a medical condition, however, where the lines disappear from the hands. There is a medical condition which has this long Latin name that I didn't memorize. But I've never seen anybody who had it. And if he's not, like, in the hospital or something, he probably... Yeah. So... He, yeah, so he, he's probably not that. Uh, the lines are a nervous system functioning. So th what that would tell me right off the bat is that there's something about his nervous system that's... Yeah. <laughs> his nervous system is different from yours and mine somehow okay. in a way that I don't know yet. But I can tell you... Um, by the way, do you think you're normal? Well, let me get, just get to know you a little better. Everybody looks normal until you get to know them a little better. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but people can be quirky. I don't know if it's... Uh, okay. So whatever it is that is going on with him, so he's quirky. And I've met people who have all sorts of weird things in their hands that I've never seen before. And what I learned was, take a breath, relax, look at the other stuff in the hands. If he doesn't have lines, look at the shape of the thumb. I could tell things by the shape of the thumb. Look at the shape of the different fingers. Look at how close the different fingers are to each other or far apart. Is there a difference between the distance here and the distance, you know? Look at the stuff I do know. When I look at the stuff I do know, there's plenty. <laughs> to your eye. Only in your case. <laughs> so no, you have to really damage your finger to get rid of a fingerprint or just cut the finger off. But the, the stuff that I look for, I don't look for the pattern minutia like the FBI. Their goals are identification if that's your fingerprint on the murder weapon or something. My goals are different. The type of pattern that it is, whether it's a one tri radii pattern or a double tri radii pattern, whether the core of the pattern is a certain type, the things that I look for are still visible almost all the time. You really have to mangle your fingerprints pretty bad for me not to see the stuff I'm looking for. So it wouldn't change anything about your fingerprints? No, and you can, you know, and you can, uh, you can rub off your fingerprints. You can cut pickles for 20 years. That'll get rid of your fingerprints, seriously. Uh, but they grow back. You really have to go deep into one of the dermal layers to, uh, to damage the fingerprints in a way that would make it impossible to tell. Or something. Yeah. You have a question? Oh, 
Thank you so much for asking me. The question is, what am I going to do tomorrow? Well, tomorrow I'm going to bring a box of magnifying glasses with me. Magnifiers that I've accumulated all over the world. Special magnifiers that when you look at your own fingerprints, you'll be able to create a fingerprint chart. And then we will learn, but first you're going to identify the, which types. I'll show you what the types look like. You'll take your best shot. Tina is going to walk around and tell you which ones you got right or She'll, in a very gentle way, will tell you that, no, this is one of these other patterns, and you'll create a fingerprint chart for yourself. And after everybody has created their fingerprint chart, I will go through the steps of fingerprint interpretation. So to do that, I'll have to do a little bit of background psychology, how, the, how soul psychology is structured, or at least what the hands have taught me about soul psychology. Then I'll teach you the, the, the rules to... Uh, decode a fingerprint chart, the algorithm, if you will, to decode a fingerprint chart, I could teach it in a couple of hours. It's not that complicated. The information that's contained can take you a lifetime of grappling with. And we will do a little bit, depending upon how long it takes us to decode our charts, we could have some weird people there tomorrow <laughs> that take extra time but uh, we will then attempt to grapple with the information presented in terms of how we understand our own life process, the events of our lives and where we are now, and the questions that we face moving forward. And we're going to use the fingerprint map to overlay the current events of our lives and how we understand ourselves. That's the goal for tomorrow. We should be able to do that pretty well in just one day. The other parts of the hand, there's three systems in the hand. To be a hand reader, you have to be knowledgeable about the lines in the hands, the hand shapes, which is extremely important, and the fingerprints. And tomorrow, we'll learn the basic rules of interpreting fingerprints. If you were going to do the hand shapes, you would need a lot more time to get the basic rules on hand shapes. And lines are tricky. Lines are poetic. The same line can have three different interpretations. And, 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 you know, hand readers who've been reading hands their whole life could stare at the same line formations and argue as to what this line formation is saying. Kind of like reading a poem. And I can go back to a hand that I read 10 years ago, and I'm a different person, you're a different person, and that poem, we can interpret it differently now, because you, look what you lived through. The poem didn't change, but your understanding of yourself might be different. So there's three different systems, and the one system I can teach quickest, and it's the depthiest one, is the fingerprints. But it doesn't sit alone. It sits in combination with the hand shape and lines, which I'll probably glance at tomorrow, because how could I not notice them? But we'll be taking a look at that. Thanks for asking so I could tell people about it. Uh, come up and talk to me at the end. I'll give you my card. Um, so I'll have a form that you can fill in and I'll be able to keep track of you that way. And there's a place to write comments and whatever you wrote, I'll call you back about whatever you wrote me about. How's that? 10 to 4 tomorrow with a lunch break. I have my book here. To, I'm, I'm being reminded. I should tell you that I've written a book about fingerprints in particular. So I, uh, let me put a plug in for my book for a second. So, uh, to make sure that I couldn't be stuck in traffic or some other horrible thing happening. By the way, I was on my way down to Palo Alto when the Loma Prieta quake hit. I had, a, I had a lecture down here and never made it. I was flashing on that as I went over the Golden Gate Bridge. But nonetheless, I did, uh, I did bring uh, my book with me and I was down here an hour early. I was reading through the intro uh, to the book. Uh, which included the, uh, the foreword by a retired, now Stanford neurologist who I became friends with who was using the fingerprint system in his own practice. Anyway, the book is available in the back. Take a look at it if you're interested. I will sign the book. It's one of my funnest things in life to do. It's to sign my book. You have a question or something? You have a website? Of course I have a website. I'm a member of the 21st century. Do you have a website? Not really. 
get fo come forward into the 20 of course you have a website you just don't know it yet so <laughs> handanalysis.net make sure you go to .net handanalysis.net of course you can google richard unger palmistry and you'll wind up there also and it's on the flyer Where is the uh, workshop? Where is the workshop? One four six Main in Los Altos. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, there's nothing. Come up and ask me at the end, or ask ask one of the. Yeah. So I guess we're winding up. We're coming to a conclusion. Let me say something in conclusion. So learning what your life purpose is, is only a first step in bringing your life purpose forward. So uh, let's see here. So I'm reading for somebody and their life purpose is artist with heart artist with heart okay that sounds easy enough artist with heart thank you see you got to go by so their life was filled with a series of very specific heart challenges apparently for this particular person i was reading for she needed three specific emotional skill sets in a certain condition or her life would be stuck so what she keeps bouncing into in life is circumstances in which the only way to handle what's going on is to deploy a particular type of emotional skill set. She keeps bumping into it, bumping into it, bumping into it to oversimplify. Let's say one of the skill sets was tough love. You know what I'm talking about? That's telling your six-year-old that she can't drive the car on the freeway because you love her, but she can't drive the car on the freeway, but you're a terrible father, she says. Okay, I'm a terrible dad, but you can't drive. So one of the skills this person needed was tough love. And guess what? Life circumstance after life circumstance was one where the failure to enact tough love or the use of tough love, one way or the other, that was going to be the central theme. She needed a certain amount of practice at this, and she needed two other skills. If she can get all three, then she's ready to get into what I call the main sequence of her life purpose, where her life looks like the fingerprint pattern that was there before she was born. But to get there, she needed to go through a very specific obstacle course. From my perspective, the stuff that was going on was obstacle two in her obstacle course. She's not doing anything wrong. She's up to obstacle two. Obstacle two requires this skill, and she's you know, C minus on this skill, not enough to get up to obstacle three. She's not even up to obstacle three. So it's one thing to announce what somebody's life purpose is, but the life purpose is a map and you can use that map to decipher what's going on. By the way, have you ever gone someplace and you had a map? Does that get you there? I mean, you can have a map to the top of Mount Everest. You still have to go through whatever you have to do. You have to be cold. You can't breathe. You know, uh, the map is not the territory itself. It's only the map. But I can say, especially if you're lost or at the crossroads, is anybody here at the crossroads in their life? If you're at the crossroads, having a map could be very useful. Yeah, but you have to know where you are first. Well, yes, you do. Thank you all very much. <laughs>